Okay, so talking today about nutrition and elimination. And wanted to start with infants and toddlers and um, just a few of the key points of breast and bottle feeding. Um, the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics recommends strictly breastfeeding um, for the first six, six months and preferably to 12, mo 12 months of age. So strictly breastfeeding through that key period when the immune system is starting to build up. Uh, infants are born with a uh, lack of immunoglobulin, so specifically like their IgG levels are low. And we know that immunoglobulins for everything that mom is exposed to, uh, in, and when in utero as well as after um, delivery, everything that she has been exposed to and has antibodies to, those will pass directly through the breast milk into the baby. So uh, breastfeeding is definitely the best choice when we consider uh, the infant's immune system. And so as providers, we wanna go ahead and try to support any moms who are hoping to breastfeed. Um, two caveats to the exclusive breastfeeding are vitamin D and fluoride. So we know that breast milk um, has everything in it that the baby needs, uh, with the exception of um, vitamin D. It does have vitamin D in, in the breast milk. However, it's not enough to um, reach the levels that we need it to reach for grow, a growing and developing infant. So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends now that for any babies that are strictly breastfed, that we begin supplementing with vitamin D and you can um, get these in like drops over the counter uh, or prescription um, and they need to continue that until they're one year of age. The other thing we need to add uh, to the breast milk um, as far as supplementing is some sort of a fluoride supplement supplementation. In bottle fed babies, once we start um, mixing formula with either nursery water or tap water, both of those have fluoride in them. So we know that even though the infant doesn't have teeth yet, they are developing teeth uh, below the gum line. So it's very important that the infants are getting some sort of fluoride supplementation if they're not getting any, t any water at all in strictly breast milk. Breast milk does not have enough fluoride in it to um, sustain healthy growth of, of teeth. So um, the other key point I wanted to make is in infants and toddlers, when we're on uh, formula, which is iron rich, um, at 12 months of age, we need to transition off of the infant formula and start feeding whole milk. So at that first birthday and the 12 month well child exam, we wanna make sure that we are doing two things, both stopping the bottle and starting on whole milk. Now at two years of age, we can go ahead and recommend that patients switch down to 2% milk. And the reason why uh, we need that whole milk at one year of age is because whole milk um, has significantly more fat in it than 2%. And um, they have found that infants really need those essential fatty acids for that rapid brain growth and development. And there's just not quite enough calories and fat in the 2% and particularly not in skim milk. So we wanna make sure that as we transition off formula, we start straight into the whole milk for that first year. Now, um, if, a, if a child is you know, extremely overweight in this first year of life, that would be a different story, but general recommendations for, for healthy infants and toddlers would be whole milk till a year of age and then 2% at two years of age. So um, why do we not want to introduce cow's milk before the first year of age? As I said before, the infant formula is uh, very high in iron and we need that iron to prevent iron deficiency anemia. 
there's a direct correlation between um, IQ and brain development and um, having good iron stores and not becoming anemic during that period of brain growth. So we know that infants and children who suffer from iron deficiency anemia um, have a higher incidence of developmental delays. So um, cow's milk has no iron in it whatsoever. Um, and in fact, it can block the absorption of iron um, from other foods and um, actually cause anemia if we're drinking too much cow's milk. So um, essentially we need breast milk or infant formula until the first year of age and then we switch over to cow's milk. Cow's milk also has, um, there's a higher incidence of allergic reactions to the milk protein and also a, a higher incidence just of food allergies in general if um, individuals introduce cow's milk prior to that first year of age. And we do see families that do this and, and, and truly it's uh, usually because a gallon of cow's milk is a lot cheaper than uh, infant formula. So we want to make sure that we uh, educate our patients on that. And of course, the best thing that we can do to assess their growth and development is to plot the, the infants and, and um, toddlers on the growth chart and make sure that they are following along on their curve and that we're not dropping down on the growth chart rapidly or going up. Um, the other thing we need to be able to educate our parents on is when we can start solid foods. That is a, um, a big question and a big education uh, consideration during the well child exam. So usually at four, to, at four months and six months, you really want to talk to uh, families about introducing solids and everyone wants to know when can, I, when can we start giving real food, quote unquote. And so the answer to that is, depending on what you read, between four to six months, we can start to introduce food on a spoon. And it's really dependent more on the developmental age of the child more than the chronological age. Uh, specifically, if they can hold their head up when they're in that sitting position in a high chair um, or booster seat or something, um, if they can hold their head up in order, you know, well enough to eat off of the spoon and can control that kind of suck and swallow that we need to, uh, and tongue thrusting that we need to um, accomplish to be able to eat off of a spoon. So um, at six months of age is the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. And what foods do we give first? Well, first we wanna give cereal. And cereal is very hypoallergenic if we use rice cereal um, so rice cereal in general is what's recommended first and um, really we're just kind of getting uh, the baby used to eating different tastes and textures because they're still getting everything they need either in the breast milk or in the um, formula for that first year. So the amount of how much solids we give, it's, it's really more, um, like I said, it's more practice of eating solids and just kind of developing um, uh, good coordination of the suck and swallow and um, learning how to eat off of food and tolerate different textures. So after cereal, uh, we start vegetables and then fruits. And the reason we do that, again, vegetables are, are fairly hypoallergenic, easy to absorb. And um, also it, that helps the infant from getting kind of a sweet tooth to where um, uh, if we introduce fruits first, you know, fruits just have a higher sugar content. And so um, a lot of times infants won't like the, um, the fruit once we, or the vegetables rather, if we start fruits first. And then meats last, meats have a higher protein uh, content. And um, usually by the time we introduce meats, it ends up being around nine months of age. And the, uh, really the kidneys are better developed by that time and can tolerate the higher protein intake uh, that meat provides. So that's just kind of in general, the recommendations of how to introduce solids. And um, also at six months of age, we can start offering a cup. Now at first, 
uh, a six month old's really not going to know what to do with a cup. We don't want to put milk or a formula or breast milk in the cup. We want to, um, you know, put water in that, or uh, you can also introduce a little bit of juice um, up to like four ounces of juice at six months of age. And again, that's just like a once a day kind of getting used to different tastes. So in general, toddlers, when we think of that after that first birthday, that first one to two years, they're um, extremely picky eaters by nature. Um, they are constantly on the go. And so educational issues at this time would be to tell parents, um, number one, not to uh, expect toddlers to sit down for long periods of time uh, at the breakfast, uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and eat in the same amount, same um, nature that we eat as adults. And so the best thing we can do is really try to catch them kind of on the go, offer frequent healthy meals, smaller meals, and um, really try to avoid eating becoming a power struggle. Because once we get into a control, um, you know, a, a battle for control with a toddler, uh, typically adults lose because that is one of the few things that toddlers can control whether or not they'll eat and what they'll eat so we really don't want to make food into a huge a huge deal um, in this age and we want to offer uh, different healthy options and put several different healthy options on um, their plate or on their high chair and let them start to choose uh, what they what they want to eat and as long as those are all healthy choices it'll be fine what they choose and then if they don't like something we just continue to offer it and try it again in a couple weeks um, when we're looking at infants uh, and trying to determine if they're getting enough formula or enough breast milk um, we look at the urinary output certainly six to eight wet diapers a day is um, the gold standard as far as whether or not an infant is getting enough breast milk in. Um, again, it's not easy to measure breast milk quantitatively, so um, it, we can't always tell how many ounces the infant's getting, but we know that if they're having six to eight wet diapers a day, they should be um, adequately hydrated and getting enough breast milk. Um, also, we expect the bowel movements to start with every diaper change and um, initially, and then that will slow down and become actually over a time uh, period of a couple months, it will start to have a bowel movement once every other day as the body becomes more adept at absorbing all of the breast milk. So we always want to check weight. Weight is definitely the best indicator of whether or not an infant is getting what they need to grow and develop. Um, and also breastfed infants, we wanna ask in our history um, and document how long they spend at breast. That first month of life, they're really um, still kind of learning how to nurse and they may be at breast for quite a, a long time. So they could be doing, um, you know, 30, 30, 40 minutes at first. Uh, but really after the first month, they, they usually become pretty adept at breastfeeding to where they can nurse like 10 minutes on each breast and, and that's adequate. So we wanna make sure they're not using mom as a pacifier just to kind of soothe themselves after that first month. So um, in a little bit older child, we want to definitely inquire, um, ask some specific questions about the amount of milk and again because milk an ex excessive amount of, of cow's milk will lead to iron deficiency anemia it'll also lead to um, a feeling of, of satiety where they carry around a cup or a bottle all day and drink milk and don't want to eat um, other foods and so they can uh, really uh, become deficient in different vitamins uh, if they're becoming even more of a picky eater from drinking too much milk. So you wanna ask specifically, does your child eat fruit? Do they eat vegetables? Do they eat meat? 
Um, certainly if they have a, uh, a vegan uh, cultural preference, then we need to make sure that we're supplementing and they're getting adequate B12 and um, other vitamins that they may not get if they don't uh, eat meat. And then also cultural preferences, just kind of looking at what the family eats in general um, and making sure that there's nothing that's omitted from their diet that would need to be uh, supplemented in some way. So when we're looking at uh, the physical exam and thinking about adequate nutrition, uh, we want to look specifically at, at the weight in the growth chart, but also look at skin. And certainly with iron deficiency anemia, we can have pale mucous membranes, pale um, uh, eyes and skin. And um, if we are having a prolonged exposure to the bottle and not weaning off the bottle at 12 months of age, then we can um, definitely develop uh, baby bottle tooth decay and you see in this picture on the slide the uh, dental caries that we have. This can also be from um, deficiency in fluoride so both prolonged exposure to the bottle and or um, having lack of fluorinated water or lack of fluoride supplements if they're strictly breastfed can um, lead to uh, really uh, fragile and brittle teeth and um, you'll get the uh, you're much more prone at that point uh, to have the baby bottle tooth decay so um, additionally we can when we're doing our assessments we need to make sure we're not overnourished and um, the picture here on the bottom is uh, some hyperpigmentation that uh, you can see in obese children that um, are starting to become insulin resistant. And that is called acanthosis, nigricans. And um, you may remember that from health assessment, but that is definitely part of the physical exam. We wanna look carefully at the skin. Uh, we wanna look behind the neck uh, in the axilla and make sure that we're not seeing that um, red flag of insulin resistance uh, and or type two diabetes in the overweight populations. And that, that skin abnormality is particularly uh, prominent in different ethnic populations like Hispanics and African Americans. Um, when we're thinking about how many calories our patients need, uh, just want to keep in mind that there are certain conditions that we will need to extend the normal caloric intake. Um, certainly any kind of um, cancers or burns, anything that increases your metabolic rate or decreases the amount of calories that you can get in um, at a time. And we think particularly of premature infants um, that have uh, difficulty with, with suck and swallow, a lot of time, and difficulty with weight gain, a lot of times we need to increase their caloric intake and use special formulas in order to um, get the calories in that they're required for growth because it just um, takes, it, it truly takes more calories uh, for them to suck and swallow, they have to work harder and have underdeveloped um, musculature to get in the nutrients that they need. So um, a, a lot of children also that are on ADHD medications, uh, we know that um, ADHD medications in the form of stimulants will definitely curb um, an appetite. And so we get a little bit of physiological anorexia secondary to the medicine and so we need to make sure that those children are having higher um, healthy but higher calorie uh, snacks and meals throughout the day so um, looking at different types of formulas here's an example of several different um, types of Similac and just to kind of point out that there are a whole lot of choices out there and, and um, families will ask you what type of formula you recommend. And so it's a good idea just to become 
you know, somewhat familiar with the different types of formula. And if you look um, at the top there, the orange can, and often patients will say, well, we're on the purple Similac or we're on the orange can. And so it's good kind of to have a, a snapshot of those as well. But the, um, the orange can there, that's a sensitive formula. So there's some formulas that are already uh, broken down somewhat and um, the proteins have been broken down for uh, the patients to more um, basic amino acid and that seems to help with digestion. The NeoSure in the middle, the yellow can, that is a high caloric formula that we uh, use for failure to thrive and premature infants. So if you look to the right of the screen there, you'll see that standard infant formulas are all 22 calories um, per ounce of formula. Um, but then we have options like the NeoSure, and that's just the Similac brand, um, that have a higher caloric intake and those are 24 calories per ounce. So basically you kind of get more bang for your buck and when the infant is um, having to exert themselves to drink, drink however many ounces they take in their bottle per feeding, they're going to get um, more calories with every feeding and that definitely helps with failure to thrive and, and with catch up growth for preemies. Uh, Elacare is just an example of a very hypoallergenic um, formula and um, higher caloric intake. Same with the purple bottom on the, bo um, on the bottom row there, the Alimentum. That is really for like milk protein allergy and um, multiple food allergies. So you'll see there's a soy formula. There's all kinds of choices. And um, really the take home message here is that there's both standard and high calorie formulas that you can help guide your uh, patients um, on which one would be the most appropriate. And also we need to consider if they are WIC eligible. eligible. And I will say that WIC uh, is very prescriptive as far as what they will cover. And if we have to change formulas, uh, there really has to be a medical reason as to why, and you have to fill out paperwork as to why perhaps they need the NeoSure for failure to thrive and prematurity or um, something like that. So, you know, if they're having severe reflux and spitting up or food allergies, you're going to have to document that and fill out um, paperwork. For those formulas and it is never a good idea to change from formula to formula to formula so you'll see families that have uh, maybe the baby was spitting up and so they've changed formulas and a week later they've changed another one and every time that we do a formula change it does um, really cause some GI uh, distress and spitting up um, just from the formula change so we want to kind of go slow and sometimes we need to mix formulas together and that seems to help with um, switching over. But I would recommend that um, you always have your families uh, talk to you before they change infant formulas. And then in the older children, thinking about nutritional needs, boys uh, require a little bit more calories than girls. So um, the lower end of that would be 2,200. With girls, it's 1,800, and that's for the school age child. And then adolescents, um, you know, we enter more of, of that um, adult-like uh, store um, calorie intake. However, adolescents, there's special considerations with them. They are um, growing rapidly. They're frequently very hungry. Sometimes they'll eat you out of house and home if you have a uh, house full of adolescents, uh, especially boys. Um, there's definitely a social component to eating and, um, you know, we, especially in the female adolescent populations, we need to make sure that um, they are not having any type of eating disorders or body image disturbances. It is not uncommon at all for adolescent females to like to not eat at all during the day when they're in school or just eat a granola bar during lunch. So we want to make sure that we're getting um, both adequate nutrition and also not getting overnourished um, during that the school age and adolescent time period. So the um, biggest concern during uh, you know this this period as well and during just the whole childhood 
uh, time frame is the development of childhood obesity. Um, and, and this is, of course, not talking about individuals that have eating disorders and um, with anorexia or bulimia, but on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we see a greater number of children, uh, more than a third of the children, that are either overweight or, over, or obese. And so what constitutes a diagnosis of obese or overweight? And so um, a BMI of greater than 85 percentile is considered overweight and a BMI of over 95% is considered obese. So when you plot children on the growth chart, you also are going to be calculating their BMI. And whereas in adult populations, we go by like a cutoff of 30, um, this is actually a percentage. So it's not a particular BMI. Um, it's an, it's a, they've made it into a percentage that seems to work better uh, with comparing children um, to other children of their age and gender. So um, why do we need to know about childhood obesity? Because truly in the primary care setting, uh, we're doing a injustice for the patients if we do not both screen them for childhood obesity, address the childhood obesity, and refer out if we're not comfortable treating the childhood obesity. So when you see a child whose BMI is, you know, 97% greater than 95th percent, and we don't actually diagnose them and document that they are uh, obese, then, um, you know, we're really not doing our job because um, in the primary care setting, that is the, where the first line contact with the families and uh, research has shown that most primary care providers, the majority do not feel comfortable addressing childhood obesity. So we really need to make sure that we have um, the proper education and proper tools, um, that we have enough educational information for our patients, and also that we, have, we take time and do follow-up appointments specifically to address uh, the nutritional issues with the children. And so what works? Um, well, the research, there's been tons and tons of research on childhood obesity over uh, the past decade, and it's really become a, a national priority. Um, but basically, what works is family-centered care. We can't just meet with the child and talk to them about healthy eating patterns and exercise when the parents are uh, the gatekeepers of, of groceries and um, you know what the child is permitted to do as far as uh, riding bikes and walking and things like that. So we need to meet with the entire uh, with the family, and it needs to be a family intervention. And the other thing that's really shown promising is motivational interviewing, which you may have uh, heard of this in the past, but essentially motivational interviewing is um, working with the child and the family and them kind of coming up with their own, finding their own in motivation to change and really determining kind of what is important to the child and what's important to the family, and this varies from culture to culture and, and family to family, and working on something that is, um, working on those goals that are actually chosen by the child and chosen by the family instead of us telling them specifically what to do. Because a lot of times what our general recommendations are as far as eat more fruits and vegetables and exercise 60 minutes a day, a lot of times that's not, um, going to work with the family is not going to be a priority. So we really need to kind of take it on a case by case um, basis and get to know the family and the child and see what, what will work for them. So just a couple of special considerations for nutrition. Um, when uh, we're looking at nutritional needs for our patients, we need to, you know, we talked about prematurity. We also need to make sure that if there's any specific food allergies or food intolerances, which are two different things, um, that they are still getting all the nutritional, uh, appropriate nutritional intake that they need for their age, whether it be calories and or um, uh, vitamins and minerals. So, uh, there's a couple pictures on here. Um, one on the right is 
a uh, special feeding um, device for a child with cleft palate and you'll see that basically that um, goes past the palate and in uh, in general just as they're able to get all the way through past the um, the the palate and past where they've had either any uh, surgical repair or need surgical repair to get down um, and to the back of the, the mat oropharynx and um, able to suck and swallow without having the um, milk reflux up into the uh, nose and sinuses. Um, on the left side, you'll see a, a child with a G-tube and with a cute little device on there. Um, we, we see lots of children that have require enteral feedings for either severe gastroesophageal reflux that um, requires a like a fundiplication where they'll go in and repair uh, the lower esophageal sphincter and put in a g-tube um, you know certainly children that have different um, like uh, neurological issues cerebral palsy things like that that aren't able to uh, get adequate nutrition will have uh, require enteral feedings um, so just a few considerations of, of different feeding feeding issues and um, making sure that we're still either referring them to a nutritionist or um, managing and screening for any type of deficiencies in our office. And then just a couple quick things about elimination. Um, this is such a big deal in pediatrics. Um, constipation, potty training, all of these issues cause a lot of um, stress for parents and are the cause of a lot of, um, or the chief complaints of a lot of pediatric visits. So just a few uh, specific ages to uh, discuss. Usually by 18 months to about 30 months of age, most children are physiologically ready to potty train. So physiologically ready does not necessarily mean that they want to be potty trained. It's a lot easier to um, just pee in a pull up. Uh, so, you know, potty training is not an easy task, but physiologically they are able to have um, bowel and bladder control by 18 months of age for most children and that between 18 to 30 months. So the average age of um, when a child should be potty trained or when most children are is two and a half years. So we kind of, um, uh, we have, we think of age three as that cutoff for normal potty training. So the average is two and a half, but the cutoff or, or kind of what's considered kind of delayed would be after usually after three years for urine and then, or for daytime control. And then we always give them an extra year for that nighttime control because that just takes a lot longer to, um, to master the, uh, you know, enuresis at nighttime. And so we'll have a lot of children that are um, completely dry during the day, but will still uh, wet the bed at nighttime for at least a year after they're potty trained. So how can we help parents? With potty training, this again is a frequently asked question. Um, we really want to, number one, not make it a control issue or a power struggle. Um, if the child doesn't seem ready, we can just kind of drop it for about two weeks or so and start again. But you need to pr teach them to praise any effort that the child gives. If they will just sit and watch cartoons on a potty chair, then you want to um, have the encourage the parents to really make a big deal out of that and praise that. If they'll sit on the toilet for just a, a minute, uh, read a book or look at something, um, then we praise that. And we certainly don't want to do any type of punishing or any negative um, uh, criticism when a child is uh, potty training and has an accident. Um, because that will really just kind of cause everything to regress quite a bit. And it's very uh, common for children who are potty trained to backslide if they um, go back to wetting themselves or having bowel movements um, 
if there's been any type of stressor, a major, you know, move to a new house, uh, divorce, hospitalization, um, it's very common for children to start having accidents again. And, and so that's usually um, troublesome for the parents, but you want to reassure them that that is normal after any type of, of major life change. And then also constipation, um, a couple points about that. Constipation is a huge, uh, constitutes a number of visits to the, uh, to the office for tummy aches. Um, most commonly constipation during the pediatric uh, years is from children holding stool. And so why do they hold their stool? Well, most of the time they don't want to stop what they're doing. They don't want to quit playing or watching a cartoons or come inside the house and use the bathroom. They just don't want to miss anything. Um, or if they have, when they're potty training or, or shortly thereafter, if they've had um, some hard, painful bowel movements, they remember that and they don't want to have a bowel movement after that. So it's kind of the cycle that happens of um, a painful painful bowel movement followed by not wanting to have a bowel movement so they'll hold the stool and they'll hold and they'll hold and then um, they can uh, actually start to leak stool around and that's called enuresis which is on the next slide but we don't want to miss any physiological causes to constipation in children um, Hirschsprung's disease is uh, basically when um, we have kind of a lack of peristalsis due to the uh, a lack of innervation to the um, lower GI tract, and so the intestines, we don't have that peristalsis and everything just kind of uh, sits still. Uh, cystic fibrosis uh, is, a, um, is a cause of constipation, and so um, when we have a child who has any other uh, you know, recurrent respiratory issues and failure to thrive and chronic constipation, then cystic fibrosis is uh, uh, certainly on the differential diagnosis. Imperforate anus just means that they, um, you know, don't have a patent anus and that can be a congenital issue. So we always want to check uh, for uh, both anal uh, tone and patency. And um, there's some neurological conditions that can cause uh, chronic constipation or the lack of ability to uh, pass stool. And one of those is a tethered spinal cord. And this is what we um, always check for that uh, sacral dimple and make sure that the sacral dimple when we're doing our physical exam is not like a very deep, deep cleft that we can't see the bottom to because um, you can have some bowel and bladder control issues in um, someone who has like an occult spina bifida or a tethered spinal cord. So in addition to the voluntary holding of stool, another functional reasons why kids become constipated is, as I said previously, they drink way too much milk. We should only be drinking two to three cups per day, small cups of milk after our first birthday. Um, or they run and sweat and become dehydrated and aren't drinking enough water. Uh, or they are not getting enough fiber intake. Certainly if our um, if they are eating macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and chicken nuggets and not eating fruits and vegetables and foods that have fiber in them, that's going to set them up for constipation. And then any medications that they're taking um, that can cause constipation as well. And iron is one of those uh, medications that particularly comes to mind um, when we're on multivitamins with iron. Uh, that will cause constipation. And then lastly, encoparesis, uh, which I mentioned before, a lot of times and when, we, when children become very, very constipated and are holding stool, uh, what will happen is they will eventually, the rectal vault will become enlarged and they get almost like what's called a megacolon and um, some of the uh, soft, less formed stool will start to actually leak around this dry, hard, large uh, stool. And um, so it looks like the child is having diarrhea and often they'll present to um, your office for diarrhea. 
And so it's very difficult to um, convince the parents that, um, in fact, they're constipated when the family is there uh, for diarrhea. But the key to this is that it's an involuntary passing or leakage. And so what you'll get is typically it's four to seven years of age males are the greatest incidents. Again, these are the kids that really don't want to come off the playground and go to the bathroom or don't want to come in from the backyard because they're playing. Um, they will say, well, I don't even really know it's happening or I don't mean to and I don't need to, you know, I, I didn't even know that I needed to go to the bathroom. Or uh, sometimes you'll see them when they're playing, suddenly they just kind of freeze and um, they'll have this urgency where they run to the bathroom, but it's, it's too late. So what happens is they kind of lose that sense of, um, the sense of the feeling that they need to have a bowel movement, and it just kind of happens uh, without their knowledge. So the way that we treat this, um, sometimes it's, it's, it's helpful to get like a, a KUB and show an actual picture something objective of, of the um, retained stool and you can show where they're um, very backed up and constipated and show that to the family. And then really you have to clean them out with, um, you know, uh, usually Miralax or another osmotic laxative, get the GI tract all cleared out. And then you kind of have to start from the beginning uh, with, uh, we call it repotty training where they start to reestablish a healthy bowel pattern. So get them all cleaned out, retain um, or remain on the uh, Miralax or other softener because once that stool starts getting hard again, it's gonna be, they're gonna have that vicious cycle again of stool holding. So basically titrating um, Miralax or a similar laxative to keep us uh, soft, frequent daily bowel movements and um, try to come up with a, a pattern to where after 15 to 20 minutes after eating um, is when peristalsis is the most active. So we want to encourage the family like every night after dinner, you want to have the child go and sit in the bathroom with a book or um, something to entertain them and just have them sit on, on the potty for, you know, 20, 30 minutes and try to have a bowel movement. And so that re-potty training will really help them um, kind of get into healthy, healthy habits um, and not hold stool. So that was kind of a lot of talking, but um, do you guys have any questions about those things? Nope. Do you guys feel good about, about poop and poop and breast milk and everything else? This is, I know, very wonderful topics, but I'm telling you, there's, you, it's amazing how many visits come to the office in pediatrics and on tummy aches. Um, for, for those of you that work in pediatrics or have in the past, do you all agree with that? A lot of constipation. And nobody ever wants to admit that their kids are constipated. They're, and, and a lot of times, I mean, after they're, after they're, you know, five, six years of age, we don't go into the bathroom with them and, and we don't always know when they go to the bathroom. So um, I just kind of wanted to provide you all with some basic guidance on those. And then um, let's see here. So we're good for next week just doing an online module and we need to get you guys in clinicals if you're not already in clinicals have you guys all had contact with your um, provide with your clinical instructors everybody doing well as far as meeting up with them okay good deal so other than the clinical calendar me put it not the clinical I'm sorry the blackboard calendar is there anything else you guys need from me Wow, you're very easy. Okay. So it's Friday, right? And you guys are all ready to go to the house. It's rough to have class on Friday. I feel sorry for you guys. You know, from here on out, everybody will have class on Thursday. So you're the last of the fr Friday cohorts. 
Okay, well, great job on your presentations, and I appreciate you guys all staying, staying tuned in. Um, just email me if you need anything, and I'll be sending out a reminder next, uh, next week when I post the PowerPoint. Okie dokie. All righty. Well, thank you guys so much, and thank you, Dr. Frazier, for getting us hooked up. All right, you guys have a great week. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.